Hello dear viewers, this is Ivan Belostenko from Ichpot Pront, Go Against the Tide TV from Krakow today. Uh, unusual, uh, we are at the 75th anniversary, uh, remembrance uh, of the liberation of the Auschwitz uh, German concentration camp. And with us we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Mordechai Paldiel. Hello doctor, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. So. Um, we, um, first of all, let me introduce you, of course, um, you have previously uh, served for at least 25 years in Yad Vashem, is that right? Uh, yes, well, I served uh, 24 years at Yad Vashem as the uh, director of the Department of the Righteous uh, Among the Nations. This is a department that honors non-Jews uh, who risk their lives to save Jews uh, during uh, the Nazi occupation of various parts of Europe. And today you uh, are a professor in uh, Yeshiva today University? Today I'm a professor. I teach uh, at Yeshiva University in a Turo College, which are both in New York. I teach uh, on the Holocaust. And in various other organizations related to remembrance and Holocaust. And I am a member of various organizations uh, like uh, the Susan Mendes Foundation, the Raoul Wallenberg Foundation. Uh, and the, these uh, organizations, they deal with honoring uh, people like Raul Wallenberg, Susan Mendes was a Portuguese dis diplomat who gave uh, uh, many visas to Jews. Uh, it deals with people who uh, rescued Jewish people during that very sad period. Let me ask you then, um, we are of course at this uh, um, anniversary here in, in Auschwitz uh, organized by the World uh, Jewish uh, Congress, uh, which you are part of their delegation here. Um, so can you tell us about the way uh, the conference here is organized? Because it's, it's, uh, it's very unique, it's, it's a bit different from the other, um, you know, the recent one in Yad Vashem. So what can you tell us, your impressions so far from, uh, from this uh, anniversary and why, did it, why was it structured this way? I think that the uh, 75th uh, anniversary, uh, it was planned, it was connected with the uh, resurgence and the rise of uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, I remember when uh, we had the 50th anniversary of uh, the liberation of uh, Auschwitz, there, there wasn't such a big problem with anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism has now come back in style uh, in many countries in Europe and in now in the United States. So people are very much concerned that anti-Semitism, if, if you don't respond to it, uh, it will grow, it will get out of hand. And the, the, the example from that, the precedent of that, is what happened in Nazi Germany. It began, when Hitler began the Nazi movement, people said, oh, he's not going to go far because people are smart, they're intelligent, they realize this, he's too extreme. Even for people who didn't like Jews, they said, but he is too crazy, it's not that far. Uh, and then what, we, know, we all know what happened. Uh, so uh, we also thought uh, that after Auschwitz, after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism is going to go down, not up. So for a long time after World War II, anti-Semitism was dormant, it was asleep by respectable people. Now it comes out in the open. Uh, and so we decided that the world has to know what Auschwitz was, what anti-Semitism or any kind of anti-tolerance, anti-Zionism, uh, tolerance, anti-tolerance can lead to. It can lead to something, maybe not Auschwitz, but something terrible like Auschwitz. Uh, the other thing is, like you mentioned, anti-Zionism. Uh, today, it's still some people, respectable people. It's not very polite to say. Uh, I'm an anti-Semite uh, by, by very uh, educated people but if you if you want to say something about the Jews it's more polite to say I'm an anti-Zionist in other words I'm not against the Jews but I'm against the Zionists what they do, do to the Palestinians to the Arabs that the Zionists are like the Nazis they do this so it's more like uh, to get away but actually under the current of anti-Zionism there's a lot of uh, anti-Semitism so uh, uh, we believe, uh, we in Israel, in America, believe that people are permitted to criticize uh, the policies of the Israeli government, that's okay. But to, uh, <coughs> uh, to, to take it under the rubric of anti-Zionism and to go out on a campaign, 
not to buy, to boycott products that come from Israel and boycott uh, Israeli professors. Okay, for instance, me. I teach at Yeshiva University. It's very difficult for me to give a lecture on the Holocaust in other um, universities in the United States for the excuses for my security because of demonstrations. No, people don't know whether I'm a Zionist or anti-Zionist. But I am Jewish, my name, Mordecai, immediately, oh, that's a Jew. So, all kinds of excuses. So, uh, why I am not invited on the campuses of universities. So, uh, the rise of anti-Semitism, I think so, many organizations and the World Jewish Congress, which fights anti-Semitism, has decided that uh, the 75th anniversary, we have to make it big. We have, to, again, to play, to play up the, the, uh, what happened in Auschwitz, Okay, uh, as against uh, 20 years ago, many people were saying, that's it, don't talk so much about it, it's the past, it's, not a, it's a horrific story. We have to war warn the world. And that is why at Yad Vashem last week, uh, they had this uh, big uh, ceremony uh, where they invited uh, about over 40 heads of state. Uh, to come to Yad Vashem uh, for doing the commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz. And that's very significant, I'm almost finished, because at Yad Vashem we don't uh, honor the Holocaust, uh, we don't commemorate the Holocaust in, April, in, uh, in January, the liberation of Auschwitz. We have a Hebrew date, which is in, in, April sometime, in April, but we decided the liberation of Auschwitz, which is a UN date, uh, January 27, that Yad Vashem has to lead the, the heads of state and they should take action against the spread of anti-Semitism in order to avoid something that may lead to a replica of Auschwitz. So that's the significance of today's uh, commemoration which uh, begins tomorrow here in Auschwitz. Thank you very much. And um, actually, that brings me to my next question. Uh, you mentioned there uh, a bit of criticism is, is always healthy. Uh, we saw your comments about the Yad Vashem um, um, you know, forum and how it was set up. Uh, we noticed here something very different. There was a lot of, uh, practically all day today, we had survivors telling their stories. So the focus was much more on the survivors. Um, why did you uh, make those statements about Yad Vashem? And can you tell us what are your impressions from... Okay, about uh, President Duda. Well, uh, everyone has his own opinion. I have my own opinion. That's my personal opinion. That's not the opinion of any organization that I belong to. Uh, there is a debate about the behavior of the Polish people towards the Jews during the Holocaust inside occupied Poland. So there was a debate, and that's legitimate. So some people can say that the Poles were this or that, they could have helped more, or they, they, they helped them the maximum. Uh, so you have a debate among historians about what happened inside Poland. That's one side of the story. But there cannot be any denial that the Holocaust took place in Poland, that all the death camps by the Germans were in Poland, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibor, Beruzhets, Chelmno, Stutthof, that's in Poland. So Poland, the Germans chose Poland as a slaughterhouse of millions of Jews, not only Polish Jews, from France, from Germany, from Italy, from Belgium, from Holland, from Hungary. And so I think that the president of Poland, in my opinion, I don't know what happened, should have been allowed to speak during that big commemoration at Yad Vashem. He is the president of the country where all these bad things happened, where all this horrific story that we call the Holocaust and Auschwitz, Auschwitz. So I don't know what happened. I don't know what politics went into it that he was told you cannot speak during the main ceremony. You can speak later on. I think, uh, I think that they are regretting now. Uh, I, but I don't know. I'm not involved in politics. But I really think that President Duda should have been allowed to, to speak. If you allow Putin to speak, if you allow Prince Charles, Prince Charles from England, spoke. But he was not involved in the Holocaust. 
he was not uh, nothing happened in England thanks God or President Macron which his country uh, didn't really so they, usually, they're not really the scorecard for for the best uh, you so, know. so the answer that I read is that they only allowed to speak the countries that were involved in liberating Europe from Nazism so England fought against Germany Russia fought against Germany uh, France. France France the goal fought against Germany but then you can also say, well, in Poland, uh, you had uh, the home army, the Armia Krajowa. I mean, so I don't want to get involved in this thing. But I think that President uh, Duda, when you invited him, after all, uh, Israel invited him to come, should have been allowed to give him a few minutes to say a few words. What happened, I don't know what caused it or not. I would allow myself a bit more uh, also uh, criticism towards uh, Israel, we both Jews, so we can, you know, we can uh, dispense with that. Um, I think also even the fact that the uh, Polish president didn't come, uh, I think from the Israeli side there should be at least some voice about the Polish righteous amongst the nations that we know they're the most numerous nation with the, the most uh, righteous amongst the nations. So uh, I was missing the voice about Poland, you know, there was not really much apart from the remarks from uh, with uh, Vice President Pence, there wasn't really much about Poland said there. Okay, so I don't know, I didn't follow the ceremony which took place at Yad Vashem. I didn't follow what people said there, what Macron said, what the others said. But uh, I have to tell you, in my estimation, the Polish righteous, uh, if you're going to make a list and say who is on the top of the line, I would put the Polish righteous on top of the line. Not because there are many more Poles than from any other country, not because of this. But in Poland, to save a Jew was much more dangerous than in any other European countries. Because, uh, first of all, the Germans made it very public b on bulletin boards. Anyone who helps a Jew will share the fate of the Jew, the death penalty. And we have at Yad Vashem many such posters. So every Paul knew that if he helped a Jew, he didn't have to go to a lawyer and ask him, what's the law? It was right there in front of him on the streets when he walked out on the streets. Uh, and the Germans treated the Poles, the non-Jewish Poles, worse than in any other country that they occupied. They treated bad uh, the French, they treated, but in, in Poland they treated worse. And many Poles, let's not forget, Auschwitz began as a camp for Polish prisoners. That's how it began. Uh, and so, uh, and at the same time, I have to mention this, excuse me, there was also a lot of local anti-Semitism. So if you are a Pole and you want to help the Jews, you have to be afraid from the Germans. You don't know if your next door neighbor is not a Schmalzovnik, okay? Uh, you know, there was a party before the war which was created by Roman Dumowski, uh, which was anti-Semitic openly. So for a Pole, to go out and help a Jew and risk his life, it was more risky for him than in any other country in Europe under the Germans. And if in spite of that he did it, then in my eyes he is on top of the list of humanitarians. So I salute them and I praise them and they can serve as a role model that people, even living in conditions such as terrible in Poland, uh, they can assume their humanity. And that's why uh, I feel that the Polish stories have special significance, above and beyond the stories from other countries. Thank you for these kind words. Uh, why do you think then that Poland is always in the news? They're, they're like Poles are like the scapegoat, like as you can say, or like they're always. Um, you, know, you don't really hear people talk about the French treating Jews, the other nations treating Jews. So it's always the Poles. Why is that? Because uh, why is that? It's a good question. Uh, the Jewish experience in Poland is very interesting. Poland is one of the few countries that actually invited the Jews to come and live there. Uh, uh, when Jews were expelled from Spain and they were expelled from various parts of Germany, uh, the Polish king, uh, Casimir the Great and so on, invited the Jews to come and live there. Uh, England expelled the Jews for 400 years. France expelled the Jews. Spain, Spain expelled the Jews. Uh, various parts in Germany expelled the Jews. Jews were never expelled from Poland, from the country. Uh, Jews uh, had uh, aut autonomous uh, government here. 
the Council of the Four Lands here, which existed for hundreds of years. So, and when Jews came to Poland, even the Jews, they, they interpreted the word of Poland in, in Hebrew, Polin, means Paulin. here we shall rest. So they must have felt very good here. And they were very good. Okay? And Jews didn't integrated. have to wear they a sign. The army, yeah, and the Polish kings, especially the kings, they protected the Jews, and I must say, silently, against the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was opposed. But the Polish kings, so by the time that the Polish kings stopped being kings, because the Schlachta, they nominated the kings. In other countries, when a king died, the family took over. Here, the nobles. And Poland began to be weakened because of the attack of the Cossacks, Chmielewski, and the attack of the Swedes, and, the attack, and Poland began to disintegrate. And Poland was divided. The only country in Europe that was divided and removed. I think that uh, Polish people began to be very resentful against uh, anyone who's not a Pole. You know, uh, if you are disappointed, if you are depressed, if you are angry, then uh, it's a situation that you, you try to blame someone else. So anti-Semitism, I, I think, began slowly. Uh, and then came, uh, Poland was restored in 1920, only for, 19, for uh, 20 years under Piłsudski, who was very friendly to Jews. Piłsudski was friendly, Jews loved him. Uh, and then for 20 years, and again Poland is divided. Again Poland disappears as a nation. Between Russia, okay, and Mr. Putin, remember, Russia and Germany decided to divide Poland between themselves. Uh, and so the frustration uh, of Polish people. And then after the war, the Russians came and, and liberated, so to speak, Poland, and they installed a communist regime, which the Poles didn't like. And the orders came from Stalin. So you have a government in Warsaw that takes its orders from Moscow. So you can imagine the frustration. So they took it out on the many, many elements in Poland. It was easy to, took it to out steer on in the that Jews. direction. Why? Because the Jews were not assimilated. They were different. They, had, they wore different clothes. They were Hasidic Jews. They didn't uh, identify with, with the Polish uh, aspirate. Not like the French Jews would identify with, with uh, France. German Jews were very great patriots. Polish Jews lived mostly their life apart spoke a different language, Yiddish mostly, a few words of Polish. So they were a, f a small group of assimilationists, okay? But most Jews were different. At the same time, the, the Polish uh, uh, people allowed the Jews to develop their own culture, their yeshivit, Hasidim, uh, Zionist organization. Don't forget, David Ben-Gurion was born in Poland. Chaim Weizmann was born in Poland. Uh, the Bund was Polish. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, his father, came from Poland. So you see that a lot of uh, major Jewish leaders came from Poland. So Poland was the home. So it's a mixed bag of uh, Jewish culture. And Poland had the largest Jewish population in Europe. Okay? But then there was a rise of anti-Semitism. And the anti-Semitism in Poland was not, not to kill Jews. But the belief that Jews... Look... You don't feel that Poland is your country, really, or you feel more... So go to Palestine, go to Israel, okay? So the Polish uh, people were very great Zionists. They were the most pro-Zionist of all the others. And they even helped the Jewish underground, uh, the Haganah and the, the Irgun, and this. The they said, sure, you, you, you deserve to have your own country. Uh, in Poland, you don't feel really Polish, which is true. Jews did not feel really Polish. Uh, okay, they felt comfortable, but they didn't really feel Polish. So there's a mixture, but, but then what happened, I believe, after Poland was liberated from the Germans, there were these pogroms, like in Kielce, uh, and uh, because what happened, the frustration of the Polish people was so strong that they took it out against the Jews, they accused the Jews of being communists, there were a lot of Jews in the Communist Party, and don't forget in 1920, when Poland was at war with Russia from 1920, uh, the head of the Russian Red Army was Trotsky, a Jew. So uh, that led to the anti-Semitism. So you have, but you, you have to, and uh, when you judge uh, Jewish relations in Poland with Poland, you just don't go to 1946, the Kielce program. 
you have to go starting from the 10th and 11th century when Jews came in. You have to go to, throughout the long history of Jews in Poland. They're mostly more positive than negative compared to other countries. Okay? I'll just give you one example. Uh, Mendelssohn, the great Jewish philosopher, he lived in the 18th century, in 1750. When he came to Berlin, he wanted to come to Berlin, they wouldn't allow him in because a Jew could not come to Berlin unless he had a special permit. So he had to get a special permit, but in Poland, a Jew could be in, in Warsaw, a Jew could be in Krakow, a Jew could be in Lublin. You didn't need a permit. Jews could travel. So you have to uh, uh, compare Poland, the situation of Jews in Poland, with the situation of Jews in other countries. And if you compare that, you can see that there's more positive about the long history of Jews in Poland than the long history of Jews in other countries. Okay? And the Polish kings uh, protected Jews. Uh, the Schlachta, uh, they used many Jews for various economic purposes. Uh, that does not deny that there was anti-Semitism. That does not deny that there were pogroms uh, in, in the modern period, okay? Uh, that does not deny that there were many Poles who didn't, who didn't like Jews, who hated Jews, okay? But I'm saying the overall picture, you have to take the, uh, the perspective of the long history, and uh, the long history is more positive, in my eyes, than uh, negative. So, why are people being uh, critical of Poland? Uh, I think it has to do also with certain things. For instance, in Poland you had the Army of Krajowa, and then you had the NSZ, and the NSZ was very bad to Jews. And many Jewish people who wanted to join the Army of Krajowa, they had to hide the fact that they are Jews because they were afraid maybe they might be killed because they are, uh, were accused of the Jews being Jido Komuna, you know, Jews were communists. Some so, said that the NSZ stuff was a bit exaggeration by the Russians to create yes. internal... Yes, and, uh, and then uh, the communist regime in, uh, in uh, Poland was very anti-Semitic. And by 1967, uh, the Jews were told to leave Poland, you know, they were expelled, they lost their jobs, mm -hmm. under the rubric of anti-Zionism too. And those Jews who were expelled from Poland, many of them were Jewish communists, but they too were told they have to get... I remember I was in Israel and I saw the Polish Jews in 1958, they came to Israel, and I, I said, these are Polish Jews, but they don't even speak Yiddish, they only speak Polish and so on. They, they were fully assimilated already. These are the Jews assimilated, and they too were told to go by the communist regime. And that's very strange for the communists to be like this. So uh, that's why uh, Jews have mixed feelings about Poland, but they are Jews who uh, speak up in favor of Polish people. And that is why, in my opinion, the Polish righteous, if you take this against all the background, and they stood up and saved Jews, then they are the best the best of the best of humanity, in my opinion. Thank you much. And so it sounds like uh, overall the history, of the Polish Jewish history is, is very good, it's very positive. So how come then, um, you know, how come we have these conflicts? I mean, I'm talking about recent conflicts. It looks like uh, these two countries, you know, Israel and Poland just can't get along all the time something. The, the Weisgard uh, conference, you know, didn't go according to the plan. Uh, Minister Katz talking, you know, nonsense about uh, Poles. So, and now this in, in Yad Vashem. So who, who is trying to, in your opinion, who might benefit from this conflict between those two countries? Uh, I think that uh, in Poland they made a mistake when they passed that law, uh, which has said anyone who says something bad about Poland can go to jail for three years. I think that was a mistake. Because uh, you should allow historians to say whatever. If somebody says th about Poland, uh, things which are not correct, then there will be others who will respond and say you are it's wrong. Basic freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. And, and you years. know, historians, they like to contradict each other. They like to be... That's how they, they, are, they are made known. Uh, you have in England, uh, you have an historian, what is now uh, David, uh, this who, uh, who was speaking up uh, positively about Hitler. And you have... Holocaust deniers who say uh, the Holocaust uh, was not so terrible, it was just a... Uh, so, if on the freedom of speech, okay, 
uh, I don't think that you should have passed a law about this. I think that was a mistake. It was just a one example, but overall, uh, do you, do you get the feeling that there might be somebody who would benefit from these conflicts, or is it just all spontaneous? I think it has to do because the poles feel, and uh, justifiably so, they they suffered more than any other country from the Germans. Uh, close to three million poles were killed in the Germans, and not that many Frenchmen, thanks God, were killed. Not that many Belgians so, and from other countries were killed. Civilians, okay? Uh, you take that the, the Polish uprising in Warsaw, which ended so bad, and the whole city was destroyed. There's no other city uh, from the occupied countries which was totally destroyed. Paris was not destroyed. Amsterdam was not destroyed, okay? Uh, Would you say that Poland so, suffered? So I think that the Poles feel uh, Unjustice. that when people attack Poland or criticize Poland, they feel like somebody is, is denying the special role of Poland being a victimized nation. So, which is not true. W w Poland uh, was a victimized, the most victimized nation of all. So I think they're very sensitive, and that's why they responded by passing this law, which I think should not have been passed the law. They should have said, they should have defended themselves. But, uh, so that created this, this debate, and that's why you have politicians making all kinds of statements. But so in your view, there's no, nobody benefits from the conflict between Poland and Israel, or are there countries, for example, that could benefit from this, such, con such a conflict? Well, uh, of course, Russia benefits from that. <laughs> uh, but the, the Russians, they have a different agenda. Uh, uh, their agenda is not so much uh, to be pro-Israel or being... Uh, but they, for political reasons, uh, uh, Russia and Poland always had a tense relationship uh, over the centuries. After all, uh, the Russians participated in the division of Poland and then the Russians signed the non-aggression pact with Hitler in 1939, which made possible World War II. Uh, and then the Russians uh, imposed a, a regime over Poland, uh, which they knew the Poles didn't like. They didn't want to be told what kind of a regime. So there's a lot of tension there. And uh, when the president of, Pol of Russia says something about Poland, I think uh, it has more to do with, with the relations between the two countries than it has to do about the Holocaust. It's politics. How would how would Israel respond if if such lies would be you know put up against Israel about Israel? Well, most Israel's historians history. say that uh, when somebody blames Poland for the start of World War II, total nonsense. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, I haven't. There's not one historian who would say yes, Poland is responsible for World War II. It's it's utterly ridiculous. Okay, so uh, among historians, uh, you're not going to find one historian who will support that uh, thesis, okay? But uh, look, uh, I tell you, in Israel, Russia is a very powerful country, and Russia is helping uh, uh, Iran, and uh, Russia is present in Syria, and in Israel, uh, they're very much concerned about Iran, that they're developing the nuclear weapon. And so uh, Israel tries to be friendly with Mr. Putin uh, in order for Putin, for Russia, to restrict a little bit Iran and not to sell to Iran the weapons, the sophisticated weapons with which Iran can then send missiles against Israel in case of a war. So this is what has to do. So Israel feels that it must have a friendly relations with Russia. And Russia is a more important country than Poland on the international scene. Poland is not involved in the Middle East. Russia is. So uh, uh, it's, it has to do with uh, Israel's uh, issue of security in the Middle East uh, because of uh, Iran and Syria. And the Russians are inside Syria and they're supporting Bashar Assad. So that, that's the reason why Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Putin try to be friendly uh, with each other. It has One nothing to do with being for or against Poland. Mm -hmm. One could say that stronger Poland means weaker Russia, which means consequently he less uh, interference in Syria. <laughs> you can uh, do one way you can do well, uh, Putin has his own agenda why he wants to be, one, why, why he wants to have a role in Syria, okay? And he has Russian troops there, Russian uh, army. So, uh, 
This has to do with the relationship in the Middle East, and Israel is very conscious of its uh, security. Uh, they are pro-Iranian militias uh, next to the Golan Heights. Uh, they are armed by Iran, and we don't want that these arms come from Russia. Uh, and Russia is, has its own policies vis-à-vis -vis the United States. So it's uh, very complicated, and that has more to do than anything having to do with the Holocaust. Because most, uh, most people in Israel uh, know uh, that uh, this debate about who started World War II is, uh, is ridiculous. At the same time, we have to admit, and that is also proven historically, that uh, without the Russian uh, effort of millions of Russians who died and the Russian army, uh, without their effort in fighting Hitler, uh, World War II would not have ended so, uh, the way it ended. I mean, uh, but that, when Hitler decided to invade Russia and the Russians fought back very bravely and uh, the Russians suffered millions of casualties, that too has to be acknowledged, uh, that they helped to defeat uh, Nazi Germany. Okay, that has to be acknowledged. So, uh, and, so this is a different uh, subject at all about uh, Russia and Israel and the Russian fight against, uh, uh, against uh, Nazi Germany. But I have to say something uh, as a historian. Uh, Putin is saying that Russia signed the non-aggression pact, the Ribbentrop-Molotov in 1939, because Putin is saying that Russia saw that the West, they wanted Hitler to attack Russia and they didn't contain Hitler. And the example that they use, and this is what Stalin said, when there was the Munich conference, when the leaders of England, France, and Italy met with Hitler in Munich, and they decided to sacrifice Czechoslovakia and give part of Czechoslovakia, they did not invite Russia. And after all, the Czechs are Slavs and they were friends. They did not, they kept Russia out of the picture and they made a deal with Hitler. And Chamberlain, came back to London and he says, peace in our time, he, the famous thing. So the Russians felt, ah, they want Hitler to come against us, anti-communist crusade. So Stalin said, I'm gonna make a deal with Hitler. Okay, I'm gonna turn the tables against them. So I'm gonna make a deal. There is some justification uh, in, in that Ribbentrop Molotov that Stalin felt that he has to keep uh, the Germans apart by taking over part of Poland as a security. But, on the other hand, the very fact that he signed that deal in August 1939 and Hitler knew he didn't have to worry about Russia, that made it possible for him to in invade Poland and take over Poland. So let's, uh, let's leave... Uh, Was it clear what I said? Yes, yes, yeah, okay. I understand what you mean. <laughs> Um, let's leave politics uh, aside. Yes, let's leave politics <laughs> aside. <laughs> and let's talk about the, the wider um, Polish-Jewish history, which you mentioned already. Uh, it's about a thousand years. Uh, how can we encourage the younger generation to learn about this richer history, not just about the Holocaust and the camps, but also about all those things you mentioned up until now? Well, there's now a new museum in Warsaw, Poling. the Polish-Jewish Jew Museum, which, which is the right step in the right direction. I think the, uh, uh, I think p uh, uh, Polish people uh, should be better informed about uh, the long period of at least 900 years when the Jews made Poland their home and where the Jews were allowed to develop their culture, their religion and everything else in here on Polish soil, okay? Uh, the major Jewish religious movements that started in Poland, okay? Hasidism, Polish soil among the Orthodox Jews. Uh, the, the, the major yeshivot, the, the Talmudic seminaries. There was a time when a Jew wanted to get uh, uh, credit from a religious seminary and wanted to become a rabbi. He came to Poland to study in the, in the yeshivas here, because they were renowned to be the best yeshivot, you know, yeshiva theological thing. So uh, there, there was a long history where many Jews felt really comfortable and at home here. 
uh, I think the Poles should be informed about that, about the long period when Jews lived in Poland and they, uh, they worked together and they, uh, they were welcomed and that the Polish uh, government welcomed, the Polish kings invited the Jews. That's another thing that is not uh, mentioned. Uh, they, uh, there are a few countries in the world, uh, Jews lived in uh, England and then they were expelled. Jews lived in France and then they were expelled. Jews lived in Spain and Portugal, and they were expelled. And Jews lived in various parts of Europe, and they were expelled and they returned. But none of these countries invited the Jews to come. Poland is the only country that invited the Jews to come. Come, live here, develop your religion. You can practice your religion as much. Kazimir was a section where they were told you can live here in Kazimierz, you can have your synagogues, your cemeteries and everything. So Poland invited the Jews to come. So that should be, I think, the Polish uh, people, the young generation should be educated about that Poland actually invited the Jews and thanks to this invitation and the protection by the Polish king, Jews were able to, to prosper, uh, both culturally, religiously and economically, Okay, to the fact that there were over three million Jews in Poland on the eve of World War II. I think not just Poles should know that, Jews should know that as well, because I don't think uh, many people in Israel know about all this stuff. Both, uh, both Jews and in Poland, the Polish people should be known. The Jews lived in Poland for such a long period, when Poland started under the Piast kings and then became the largest country, the strongest country, and, and they lived in Poland and they also suffered when Poland suffered, when Poland was divided, there were Jews who were uh, involved in the rebellion against uh, the Russians, the rebellion Yoselovich uh, and some of these Jews who fought with the Poles, uh, with Kuczkiosko and so forth. So the, uh, the Jews uh, really uh, wanted to stay in Poland. Okay, the Jews really felt for most of the time, uh, they felt that Poland was good to them, okay? Uh, so if you take the long history, of course, the, if you take some periodic history, then you can show, oh, yes, and here they were bad to the Jews, and here they told the Jews, get out, and here they told this, and here at the universities, Jews uh, could not sit on the benches, they had to stand, and so on. If you take uh, a short history, you can show the negative. If you take a long history, you can show that there was a lot of positive things in Jewish life in Poland. And I think also important to notice that uh, those worst 100 years, more or less, of yes. the Jewish history in Poland, the worst part is when the, Pol the Pol Poland actually didn't exist or was on the way to be extinct. You know, I'm talking about the period of World War II when the exile, the government yeah, was in exile. The, the worst part of the Jewish experience in Poland, that's a good point, the worst part was also the worst part in Polish history, where the, where the Poles, their independence was challenged, Okay, when for over a hundred years there was no Poland, it was part of Russia, Prussia, and Austria, and, and then you Germany. can, huh? And then Germany. And and then for a short period, just twenty years, they became independent, and then again, okay, and then communism was installed from Moscow. So you can understand the frustration, okay, of the people of Poland, and when people are frustrated, very frustrated. Sometimes they make, they accuse the wrong party. Okay. It's easy to manipulate them also and direct the and anger so towards It's easy to manipulate. For a person who's very frustrated and very upset, then you can come up to the person and say, you know why you're upset? You know why this is because of these uh, Jews? It's because of them. Oh, okay, now I know. Okay, out with the Jews. So you have to take the Polish history, okay? Uh, which is not such a happy history in Poland uh, after the 17th century. Up to the 17th century, up to when Poland was divided, uh, Poland was very prosperous and a good country and there was very little anti-Semitism. The only anti-Semitism was the religious anti-Semitism, that Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus Christ and therefore so forth and so forth. But uh, in general, Jews lived a, a good life here. 
Dr. Padino, thank you very much for, for all these uh, words of wisdom and this knowledge. It's Do a little bit complicated, but... Uh, it, it's Maybe they'll just need to watch it a couple of times. Huh? <laughs> maybe I they will just need to watch it a couple of times if it's too yeah, complicated. Yes, so uh, it's, uh, you have to... Uh, and I'm not denying that they're doing the German occupation. There were some Poles who harmed Jews. I'm not denying Yedvabne. Okay, Yedvabne did happen. It was terrible, okay? There were such incidents, and that has to be also pointed out, okay? Uh, but uh, I don't think we should accuse the whole Polish population because of Yedwabne, okay? Uh, I don't think we should accuse all the 30 million Poles because of Yedwabne. So you point out Yedwabne, but you have to point out the other positive things that were in Poland uh, over the long history of Jewish life in Poland. They by far outweighed the... the by far, it, I, think, I think it outweighs, yes. Some people may say no, but I think that most historians will say it outweighs. It's very positive. Well, the War Crime Commission in Israel said that it was just 0.1% of Poles who have collaborated with, uh, with Nazi Germany. Yes, yeah, so uh, th there was collaboration, uh, but not political collaboration. No, there was no p political collaboration between Poles and Germany because the Germans refused to have anything to do with, with Poland. Poland was to disappear from the map, okay? Uh, There's no, no, no guards who were Polish in the concentration camps. There were no Polish guards and this and that. There were Ukrainian, Latvians, uh, Lithuanians and so forth. And these were the political collaborators, okay? Slovakia had political collaborators, Hungary, uh, uh, Romania, okay, Croatia, the political collaborators. In Poland, not. They were not Polish uh, guards. On the other hand, you have the Polish police, the Granatova, you know, and some of them were not so good to Jews, some of them were good, okay? So you have a mixed bag. So I'm not saying that everything negative just shove it under the table. You can point out. But don't reach the conclusion that everything was negative. Don't say because of this, then everything is negative. The whole picture is negative. I would say the whole picture over a long period. And I always say, when Jews came to Poland and they, they felt comfortable, they said, Pauline, here we shall relax. They didn't say this when they came to other countries. And Moshe Iser, uh, the rabbi from, I think, 15th or 16th century, yes. said that uh, Judeo, um, um, the paradise for Jews, uh, what was the, the name? Um, Judeo Paradeum, something like that. So, yeah, I'm not so familiar with that part and so on. So I think you have to draw out the whole picture, okay? It's, a, it's sad that it ended so bad in 1967 when the last Jews of Poland were told to leave by the communist regime. So that's the other paradox. When, when you accuse the Jews of being communists and so on, it's the communists that expelled the last Jews from Poland. They were not communists enough. Huh? They were not communists enough. No, because they were anti-Semites. The only people that really expelled Jews from Germany were the communists. The communist regime. The last uh, 50,000, 60,000 Jews. So you cannot accuse the whole po Polish population because of the communist regime. Okay? The communist regime was terrible. Take the case of uh, Tadeusz Pilecki. Tadeusz Pilecki in Auschwitz. He was executed by his own government. A man that was in Auschwitz volunteered to go into Auschwitz. Pilecki. Witold Pilecki. Witold Pilecki, yes. I said Tadeusz, I'm sorry. Went into Auschwitz and then escaped and gave the first report about what was happening in Auschwitz. He should be a hero for the Polish people. After World War II, he's arrested accused of being a spy for the British, and executed so, by the communist regime. So, you could, if I were a Pole, I, I would be so angry that a man like Witold Pilewski was executed by my own government. My own government. It's not my own government. It's the government from Moscow. Okay? And to this day, we don't even know where his body is. So you can imagine the, the anger and the frustration, okay? So that, that, uh, that has to be taken into account in the overall general picture. Dr. Padilla, thank you much for, for all this great information. Uh, we also want to, to know, um, mention what we've uh, 
talked okay. about here before, uh, the Yarosh family, uh, all of their... Does it, does it have English uh, subtitles? Yes, yeah, it has English subtitles, you can find it on our channel. And the entire family have saved Jews and we're going to have uh, more, uh, more of their family members, uh, more programs with them, more films with them. Uh, this is a gift for you, of course. Uh, so, thank you very much. Any last comments, any last words for our viewers? My last comment is, uh, we have to do more to tell the story of people like Yarosh. We, we have to show to the rest of the world that people, individual people, can make a difference. They can make the right decision. And uh, the thousands and thousands of polls that we honored at Yad Vashem, and I worked at that, uh, was very much responsible in that, each of them made the right decision uh, of trying to save a human life. And the decision that they made is not because someone told them to do it. Not somebody told them, you have to save because this and that. They made, it was a lonely decision. Uh, they had to keep it a secret for security reasons. And yet they made that decision. And I have to add, there were some, quite a number of Poles who were caught and killed Okay, we Which have them, their entire family sometimes. Sometimes the entire family. Uh, we have records at Yad Vashem of Poles who were arrested and uh, either shot or they were tried by a court and they were sent to concentration camps uh, where many of them did not uh, survive. So there were Poles who, who unfortunately, somebody betrayed them, uh, some Shmatsovnik or something, and they. Uh, uh, it cost them their life. So to do a good deed, to help others, when it doesn't endanger your life, that's easy, okay? If you ask me for a favor, I don't have any money, can I, I need something to buy lunch. I say, hey, take a hundred slot to go buy lunch. I'm not gonna go to jail for that. I'm not gonna go to a concentration camp. But if, if I have to give you a hundred slot and I know somebody sees me and says, he gave this man a hundred zloty for lunch and I can lose my life. Maybe I can say I got a wife and children. So for these Pauls that they knew that they could lose their life by admitting a Jew in their home and yet they did it. And they did it because they made a, it's a personal decision. It's not something that they heard on the radio uh, and the radio said help the Jews or something. It's a personal decision. I think that should be shown as examples. And the Polish righteous, I think, uh, they faced more dangers than in any other country in Europe. Because when they stepped out of their home, they saw a big poster. Anyone who helps the Jew will be shot. They saw it right there. So they knew what they were facing. So I think that should be pointed out more and more. Dr. Padio, thank you very much for your time and for this interview. We'll hope to see you again. You're welcome. Soon. Thank you very much.